welcome to worship. We are so glad you're here to worship with St. John's United Church of Christ, where we like to remind everyone that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. As we gather our hearts and minds for worship, let us together turn to our choral introit found in our worship outline, which you can find in the pews or online at stjohns401.org. And we will sing together, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. worship, we come carrying prayers on our hearts and minds that weigh us down, but also carry us forward. So let us take time now to acknowledge our prayers of joys and concerns. Let us pray. Glorious and wondrous God, we come to you with prayers both spoken and left unspoken. For all those prayers that weigh us down with concern and sorrow, dear Lord, let us give them up to you so that you might lighten our burdens and strengthen our hearts to go ahead. May you mourn with us. May you ease our sorrows and comfort your people. May you give peace to those full of anxiety and dread and help them to see your hopefulness. For all of our prayers of joy and thanksgiving, dear God, may they, we lift them up to you, recognizing that each great gift comes from you, and may we bring you full praise as we see these prayers surround us. Gracious God, we thank you for, our, for your presence with us today and ask that we become fully aware of it throughout our lives. May we continue to take our prayers to you and may we be open to see how it changes our lives. In your name we pray as your son teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to join with me in our hymn, Rejoice, Give Thanks, and Sing. <laughs>
Many words make up the staple of our faith, and today we join together in speaking words that are given to us psalms and are repeated throughout many of life's milestones. Let us join together in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Scripture reading for this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, my brother and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eudodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, 
help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with what, whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and in all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In January, I will be celebrating my 10-year anniversary of ordination, and I have had the great honor of being a pastor for that time. And I have been in ministry for enough years to say, I hate election years. <laughs> I hate election years. It is a sad and frustrating experience as a pastor to see people suddenly get all passionate about important issues and do it in ugly ways. And then no matter what the church says or does around the issues that are important aspects of life, it is deemed political. The idea that politics have all the say issues makes me furious. But that anger and frustration is useless because we see enough of it in the world and it is not productive. The topics that we hear discussed and debated that people get passionate and angry about are indeed important topics, are things that we should all be thinking about and engaging with. But for some reason, election year brings out some of the things that I am most ashamed of in humanity. We read a scripture today that talks about two wonderful, strong leaders in the church who have started to butt heads. And Paul urges these women to be of one mind. Now that does not mean that he expects these women to agree on everything. But when it comes to being one mind in Christ, it means love the Lord your God and let the rest follow. I hear debates between politicians and between passionate people and I feel as though many times we forget that the only reason your opponent engages you in the conversation is usually because they are equally passionate about this important thing. 
there is an equal amount of love for this country and to see the world succeed. But when you go into a conversation and you expect to be butting heads, then we tend to do this unfortunate thing where we walk in defensive. And I will tell you, I am probably, ter I am the worst at this, especially in my marriage. There are things I do that will irritate Mike, and I know it. So when I walk in the door, I think, oh, I'm going to hear about this because I went out and did such and such, and it's going to irritate him. And so I walk in the door, and I hear those terrible words, we need to talk. <laughs> and all the red lights go on in my head and I switch into defensive mode and I say, well, I know we need to talk and let me tell you something. He's sitting right here. He's laughing. He's got a good sense of humor. Because it's true. We switch into defensive mode before we ever know. For all I know, he's saying, your mother called just to say hello, but no. I'm in defensive mode, so no matter what he has to say, it's not going to go well. But I see this more and more with all of us when we go to engage in passionate conversation. Whether it has to do with health, or finances and economy, or prejudice, or business, or church, I see people walk into these conversations defensive. ready to defend themselves and their people or whoever they've decided to defend. We think that it is a sign of strength. We think that it's going to help us in some way. But when Paul goes to ease tension in the church, he never goes in with defensiveness or encourages defensiveness. In fact, multiple times, he and Christ, Christ's self, says, go in with humble hearts. Recognize what you have in common and where that passion springs. And meet each other on equal footing. If your opponent comes at you with defensiveness, you need to step off and not rise to that level. We read often, when we read Paul's letters, about tension in churches. In fact, even that great scripture, Corinthians 13, that we think of, 1 Corinthians 13, we think of love is patient, love is kind. We read it at weddings. It gives us this warm and wonderful feeling. It is a beautiful poetic scripture, but it is in fact written to a church that has forgot how to love. And it is a reset. Defensiveness also kind of gets us distracted from our original passion. We get so caught up in how to be defensive or how to maintain our ground and show a strong front that we kind of forget what we're fighting for. If we're fighting for equality, or a lack of prejudice, then going in with anger is probably just going to build more prejudice. If we're fighting for some kind of equality in equ economics, and we go in with some strong show of power, and that is all that we want to present, then we're probably going to encourage a power fight. People are always going to disagree. That is the beauty of individual minds. 
That is the beauty of church as a community, is the fact that we all come together under one passion and faith of God. And we recognize that the Spirit moves in all of us, and through our different life experiences and knowledge, we are able to engage the Spirit differently with the way we encounter each other. Because for many of us, we cannot even conceive the way the Spirit moves in another person who lives life so differently from us. But church helps us to engage that Spirit, helps us to understand how people who live life so differently can come to understand, celebrate, and honor God just as much and sometimes more than we do in our own hearts. That diversity increases faith and strengthens community if we are humble enough to engage it with compassion, with peace, and with understanding. It is not easy. The scripture that we read today, Paul writes beautiful things, and as people removed by thousands of years, it sounds beautiful and wonderful and ideal, but I have a good feeling that our sisters Arudia and Sinches were not as excited to hear these poetic words. Because they called these leaders to be respectful. to get over themselves and to think about their community. It called for hard work. Being able to engage our passions in ways that are healthy and encouraging not only to ourselves but to the people around us is not always easy. Quite frankly, it's often countercultural nowadays. But that is our job as Christians. It's not our jobs to point fingers and call each other out because that's just another form of defensiveness. But when you go in with a humble heart, you go in with an openness to say, this encounter may change me and I am ready. I am ready to see how the Spirit may move and to be changed in wondrous ways. I am ready to see where the Spirit holds me fast and reminds me who I am and where my faith lies. May we go forth with humble and compassionate hearts. May we go forth with a joy for our passions and loves, and find ways to share them so that our opponents and neighbors and even our enemies might be able to listen. May the Lord strengthen you and encourage you. May you be capable of all things through Christ. Amen. Each month we set aside a small offering for a special community program or fund that helps to empower the church as a whole or a small part of our community. This month in October, we set our second mile for the pastor's discretionary fund that essentially helps fill the gaps. When needs are presented in the community where we can't find any other resources, the pastor's discretionary fund helps to fulfill those needs. So we invite you to give as generously as you are able to the general fund to our second mile. You may do this online through stjohns401.org or by dropping off or mailing your offering to the church.
We give thanks for all those who are able to give of finances, and we pray for all those who are struggling. We give thanks also at St. John's for the many other gifts that are given to the church through time and talent because, oh Lord, we have so many. Let us take time to give thanks for all of our gifts today. Please join me in our doxology. in their hearts. For all gifts given, dear God, please bless them so they might go to encourage your kingdom here on earth and the faithfulness of your people through, through the world. Gracious God, may these gifts be seeds of hope and encouragement. May we continue to give as we recognize the beauty and the joy that you continue to give to us. May these small symbols of our gratitude be those seeds of hope. We pray this prayer with joy and thankfulness. Amen. I now invite the congregation to join in our final hymn. All of life is filled with wonder.